market is on a tear. NASDAQ 7,000, here we come. <laughs> yeah, I mean, seriously. It's crazy. February sitting here, NASDAQ 2,500, NASDAQ 3,500. All right. Will it ever get back? <sighs> All right, welcome to Fort Knox, everybody. Live once again at the NASDAQ market site, and I'm here with Jason Calacanis, author of Angel. Yes. And I would have to paraphrase the rest of the title. It's basically how I started with $100,000. Oh, there it is on the screen. How to invest in technology startups. Timeless advice from an angel investor who turned $100,000 into $100 million. Yeah. How can you not read this book? Yeah, right? I kind of have to, right? You're obligated at this point. But uh, thanks for having me on the program again. And, uh, yeah, the book uh, turned out great. I, I wrote it myself. And it's just an honest look at what I learned over 150 investments and all the mistakes I made in the first 50 or 100. And we're going to be on the cusp of a, reserv um, a revolution about angel investing now because we have used to be maybe dozens of angel investors in the tech industry. Now we have hundreds to thousands. Right. And they're in each city. And soon consumers are going to be able to get involved in this uh, with equity crowdfunding. So the world's changing very quickly, and access to these companies, which stay private longer, is something that everybody realizes is a good opportunity. So people are dipping down into that private market. Let me reset for everybody. We are actually recording the Fort Knox podcast right, right now as well. This recording will be available Sunday night-ish. That's usually Perfect. Uh, when I put it up. But you get the opportunity to sort of see it happen live, which is amazing. and then you'll get the podcast uh, Sunday night. Monday morning as well. We did this with Paul Jacobs, Qualcomm's executive chairman, a few weeks back. Yeah. Now we get to do it again yeah. with you. Okay, so people are going to want to know before they get this book, why should I take advice from Jason Calacanis? Okay. Sure. You, you invested in Thumbtack yep. early. Yep. You invested $25,000 in Uber. Yeah, it's back third, when for third Uber, or fourth investor. Right, was, was just in San Francisco. $4 million company. Paint the picture for me of the setting. Yeah. where you had Travis Kalanick in conversation. Sure. You and a couple of other people decide to invest. Yeah. What do you think it is at that point, and how did, how did you come to have that conversation? So I knew Travis from his previous two companies. When I started as a journalist like yourself, I had interviewed him and stayed friends with him, and I just watched him go through two companies and have you know rough patches at both of those, and I just thought, this is the most dogged entrepreneur I've ever met. He never gives up. And when he showed me what he was working on, I immediately said, hey, can I invest? And I was just starting my angel investing career now. I think that was maybe my third or fourth investment. And we just happened to run into each other at the Embarcadero, you know, basically on the water in San Francisco at a party. He showed it to me. And I was like, well, it's obvious. Now, what was it at that point that he showed to you? It was a, literally one Lincoln Town Car on a map moving yeah. around. And, you know, you got to remember the iPhone back then had just come out. It was a couple years old. And the App Store had just come out. And it was a new thing to have GPS on your phone. For a consumer to have GPS, you remember back then you would give people for Christmas a GPS, a Garmin, right. that they could mount in their car. And it was three or 400 bucks. You had to change the SIM card to change the maps. But Apple said, hey, we're going to put maps built into the phone. And I, think, I don't know if that was the second or third phone that had GPS built in, but it sure was a revolution. And that was the why now. And the genius then was Uber would win. cabs in San Francisco, notoriously terrible. Horrible. I used to work in the financial district. It's sort of like Brooklyn. Um, yeah, I mean, just really bad. Yeah. And uh, they had black, Uber had black cars. Yep. They would find you based on where your phone was with GPS built in. Yep. And that whole credit card thing was built in where you never had to worry about tapping around. You could just yeah. get in, you could get out. Or filling out know. vouchers. Remember in the old days, we'd fill out a voucher right. if we worked at a corporate account. And they would put on all these extra charges after you signed the voucher. And it was all kinds of craziness. And it was half price. So I just thought, wow, this is going to be something big. Uh, but you never know when you're first meeting these companies. They're all very awkward. They're all a fraction of what they will eventually become. Right. And so, well, some of them are. <laughs> yeah. I mean, generally, they're... Some of them are a multiple of what they will eventually become. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, sometimes they have down rounds. Um, but generally speaking, it's like teenagers are kind of awkward. There's some promise, and you have to sort of squint a little bit and see the adult that they'll become. And, you know, if you look at Google or YouTube or even Facebook, you know, Google was the 11th search engine, 12th search engine. YouTube was probably the 50th video site. And Facebook was maybe the 20th or 30th social network. So why did those, you know, sites and those companies, which came 10th, 20th, or 30th, or 50th, become the number one player, the founder? You invested $25,000 when it was worth $4 million. Correct. Okay. 
Uh, you now, start doing some math. Yeah. Now it's worth. I mean, we don't we don't know. Currently, Uber's been having some some trouble headline wise. The last valuation was seventy anybody. billion, right? When people oh, yeah. bought shares. Right, seventy billion. So One how much is your twenty five thousand worth? Uh, it's over nine figures. Yeah, so it's worth over nine figures, uh, well over nine figures. And, you know, the other uh, items in my portfolio are worth, you know, tens of millions, uh, and that's great. So I think combined, you know, the, it will definitely be the majority, and that's sort of how angel investing works. You have some, you know, investment that is 80, 60, 70, 80 percent of your returns. Uh -huh. The rest are 20 or 30 percent, and then you know, a whole swath of 100 companies that just don't work. So let's hit the rewind button, because yeah. obviously you had – $25,000 sitting around to yep. give to Travis, right? Yeah. A lot of people do not have $25,000 yeah. yeah. sitting around. Uh, how did you get to that point? Because you grew up, what, a middle-class kid yeah, in basically. Brooklyn? Yeah, in Bay Ridge. Your dad yeah. had a bar? Dad had a bar. Mom was a nurse. And they were barely struggling to get by, as I talk about in the book. And it's not an autobiography by any, any stretch, but I but do talk about it. You set the scene. Yeah, I sort of set up the scene that I, you know, I didn't come from money and didn't know anybody. Uh, and I became a journalist, met a bunch of people in tech, and then eventually became an entrepreneur and started companies. But I talk about in the book how I made my first half million dollars by being an advisor to companies. And I would basically trade my services for equity in their companies. Your and, first half a million dollars at what point? Uh, yeah, this is 10 years ago, 12 years ago. So I had two big hits. Uh -huh. One of them was uh, being an advisor, and the other one was I sold a blog company, Weblogs Inc. I was going to get to Weblogs Inc. Yeah, yeah in so. Gadget and a bunch of others. Yeah, sold to early. AOL. There was there was Gawker Media. Yep. And there was Weblogs Inc. And they were both rolling up all these different blogs into yep. a network where you yep. could, you know, get enough scale for sure to sell advertising. Yeah. When you could sell advertising, and right. back then Google and Facebook hadn't run the table yet on advertising. They didn't have very sophisticated networks. Facebook didn't exist. Um, and Google was just getting started. So it was, uh, and actually we were a partner of Google's. We used to run Google's ads on our site. So Google was very collaborative with content companies back then. But we had the, the sense to sell it for 30 million bucks 18 months after we started it. And then we saw with Gawker, you know, that company wound up selling for, you know, 100 and change and then had to give 50 million of it to uh, Hulk Hogan. Uh, yeah, it was, so it was a pretty messy outcome. So I think we probably did the same as the founders of Gawker. We just had to do 10 years of less work. And so you personally, after that sale, yeah, were, I was set. We're rich. Yeah, it was by, pretty mind blowing. By ordinary people standards, maybe not yeah. by Silicon Valley standards. But well, I mean, you could, you know, when you when you hit that ten million dollar mark, five, ten, fifteen million dollar mark, you probably are not going to have to work again if you if you live a, a you know a, a not insane lifestyle. Um, but for me, it was never about the money. I think there's a moment at which you have escape velocity where you don't have to worry. And you can take maybe a 10-year view or a 20-year view of your life mm -hmm. and not be in that constant panic. But I spent the first 35 years of my life in that panic. So I relate to it very much when I you know, talk to founders or other investors or just friends of mine and family members. And I think becoming wealthy is virtuous. And is I think virtuous? I, I do believe that. I think working hard and becoming rich is a good thing. Um, I think it's... So working hard... Is virtuous or becoming wealthy is virtuous? Both. You could, Both. Really? Yeah, I do believe that. I, I, I think right now we have a, a, a lot of negativity. Because people become wealthy all kinds of ways. Well, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say wealth by any, at any cost is a good <laughs> idea. So, like, if you're reading this and you think I should rob a bank, no. But becoming an entrepreneur and being successful and then as a consequence of that success and that focus or working on startup companies or angel investing in them is a very virtuous product. Uh, process because you're building products that the world needs. It's very hard to have a successful entrepreneurial outcome without solving problems for people, without providing value. It's, it's happened, you know, I, I can't think of a company that became very successful without solving a big problem or helping people in some way and making their lives or their company's lives better. So I think it's virtuous. I think capitalism's got a little bit of a black eye uh, because it has run amok at times. And we do have a disparity in society where Upward mobility is harder, but once mm -hmm. you have wealth, it's very easy to keep increasing it. So this polarization of wealth is a problem, and the reason I wanted to write the book, and writing books is an opportunity cost if you're a successful person. It takes a lot of time, and the compensation is very low, but I wanted to write it because I do think angel investing is this great hack. If you're willing to do the work and you're willing to dedicate yourself to it for five or ten years, you could move from being poor or lower middle class to being wealthy and rich. And people can now... Invest alongside you. So, sure. so you know, people who are looking to just get into angel investing don't have a huge dollar amount 
yeah. to contribute to it can get in on your syndicate yep. and and a vessel outside. I mean, I guess in a way the book is marketing for sure. that. Like people yeah. will so, come and invest alongside you. You'll you'll have hope, more yeah. money that you can put into deals, and that's good for you. Yeah. Right now, I've got an unlimited supply of capital. I can. Uh, attract as limited partners to invest with me. So I've chosen, uh, you know, because if you hit a couple of these unicorns and I've hit six, people love fund managers who can hit a unicorn, let can alone. Can you name all six? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Uber, Thumbtack, Data Stacks, and then Wealthfront, Desktop Metal, and Robinhood. Mm. Um, and if I, I was just doing some research on those six names, and the first three were all under $10 million valuation, and two of them were under $30 million valuations, and then one of them I was an advisor to when they just started and they were probably worth 30 or 40 million. So of those six, the combined value of all of them was under 100 million put mm. together mm -hmm. when I invested in them. Uh, and so uh, it's very easy to get these nameplates and put them on your website if you're an investor. You can just buy secondary shares when it's worth a billion or five billion in the private markets. You could be an investor in Dropbox right now just by buying it at a $10 billion valuation on a secondary market doesn't mean you were there when it was worth 10 million or right. 15 million or 30 million and that's the harder bet to make so you say in the book that you started off basically with a hundred thousand dollars yeah the that's first the value four or five first investments, four or five investments yeah. first four yeah had. I think yeah um, were you planning to invest more than that or yeah are you just how much how much is the pool of money before you started reinvesting yeah uh, what you would make I was very lucky because when I started I was making little 10k investments on my own money and being an advisor, and then Sequoia Capital, the number one venture capital firm in the history of Silicon Valley, which did Google, YouTube, said, hey, we think you're smart. How about we give you some money, and we'll split it 50-50? So they gave me, I did 19 investments with them as a Sequoia scout. So I was a scout for do? them. Uh, well, yeah, they got half that return, so <laughs> it's worked out very well for them. And uh, we've, been, we've had a great collaboration. Uh, I don't have an official capacity with them anymore. I do some scout investing with them, like one a year. But basically, in my incubator, I'll have uh, the incubator companies come see the Sequoia team, or they'll come to our events. Uh, That's so, got to help you with deal flow. I mean, for if, sure, if people yeah. know that you know the Sequoia folks, and you can bring them in for a meeting. The good news is, you know, when you hit these unicorns, one in every 25 or one every 20 investments, Everybody in the venture community wants to be my friend now, even the people who don't like me. So <laughs> they have to deal with me, which is pretty funny. Uh, but, you know, in the book, I sort of talk about, hey, this is a very opaque process. In the book, I'm not saying you'll have the same returns as me. I'm not saying it will be easy. In fact, I say the opposite. It's going to be hard, and you might not have the returns of me that I've had, but because I'm certainly an outlier. But if you do it correctly, I think there is a reasonable chance that you'll be positive in these investments. And in the worst case scenario, if you invest 5% or 10% of your net worth and lose half of it or even all of it, you'll have invested in 40 or 50 high-tech companies and you'll learn a lot and you'll have built this incredible network in Silicon Valley. So most people who angel invest that I meet are not very focused on returns. They're, they're doing it for the fun of it and they like... They're gambling. Yeah, and I take an approach to it which is like, okay, that's fine if you want to do that. What I try to do the book in the book is steer people towards being a professional poker player, uh -huh. not a recreational poker player. So if I'm um, um, upper middle class, yep. white collar professional in Minnesota, yeah. and I'm interested in angel investing, I read your book, yeah. what are my chances of real success? Because, I mean, come on, you, you had an in-person meeting with Travis Kalanick yep. based on networks that you had in the Valley. You had sure. reported on him as a journalist before. Right. Now you're an investor. I mean, most angel investors out in middle America who might read this book are not going to have that first basis. Yeah, connection. I think that's correct. So um, does that mean their odds are worse than yours would have sure. been? Their odds will be worse, yeah. I think, and then there's probably people who have a bigger network than me. Who, uh, who might or maybe, not be reading your book. Who <laughs> might not be or They may have a better network than me, or they might have a skill set like maybe they're great at sales, or maybe they're great developers and product designers that they bring something to the table I don't bring to the table. So these startups are always under-resourced at the beginning. And if somebody's in middle America and they were a great uh, developer, they might be able to find a startup that would be willing to give them shares just for helping architect their software. Uh -huh. Or they might be able to invest alongside other investors using Seed Invest or my syndicates at jasonsyndicate.com or AngelList. There's a bunch of sites where angel investors say, I'm putting 25K in, I've got another 200,000K. Uh, $200,000, and I can have up to 99 investors there. So basically, if you put in 1000 or $2,000, you can come along for the ride with me. So in the book, I say your first 10 investments should be in products in Silicon Valley, in syndicates, 
make it no more than a thousand or two thousand dollars and make it in companies that have products in the market already and that those products have either revenue or significant growth traction. In other words, the number of users is growing 20% every week or 10% every week, week over week, or 50% month over month. If you, if you do it that way, it will take you a little bit of time to find those opportunities. Maybe you do it over six months, doing one or two bets a month of 1000 or $2,000, and then you learn. And once you learn, then you'll know who are, in, in those 10 investments, who are the co-investors. Well, there's probably 20 investors in each company. Now you have 400 co-investors. You make a Google sheet of those 400 investors. You find their emails. And the next time you go to Silicon Valley, you say, hey, I'm coming to Silicon Valley. I'll be here for four days. Would love to meet you for coffee. And here are what deals you're investing in. And I'll tell you about what's working in my portfolio. That's how this industry works. It's very collaborative in the early stages. So you got to travel. I think going it's to Silicon Valley in San Francisco for a couple of days, a month, would uh -huh. let you reasonably do this, actually. So and it's in, like being a real estate investor in a way. Like, you can get some rental properties out in Silicon Valley. Sure. you got to go visit them every once in a while. Put eyes on them. Even if somebody else is managing it for you because you're in a syndicate, y you're going to want to understand some yeah. basics about the property, about the neighborhood, so you yeah. can know what your next investment is going to be. It's just like investing in anything. You know, if you... If you were an investor in a company like Theranos, right, and we, we talked about them a lot when we were doing our CNBC Squawk Alley hits, you know, a lot of the people who invested in that company never took the blood test. They never went to Walgreens and took the blood test. They, they never were able to see the, in, the technology. That would be an example of doing it wrong. Mm. And anybody who has uh, invested in Airbnb or Uber or Lyft or Postmates, if they've used that product and they meet the people who are using those products. People are passionate about those products. When you meet an Airbnb host or you stay in an Airbnb or you know somebody who stays in Airbnbs around the world, they can't shut up about it. Mm -hmm. They love it. And that's really understanding the customers, understanding the product experience, and being able to talk to the founder and say, hey, why does Airbnb work the way it does? Or why does Postmates work the way it does? Or Uber? When you start to get into that rhythm, talking to the management team about why they're making decisions and talking to the customers, you become a very dangerous investor. You're just, you get to see the entire chessboard. Now, when you're meeting with 100 companies and passing on 90 of them, now you're becoming a master chess player because you're playing 100 games of chess every month, you know, and you're mm -hmm. watching it and you're staying in touch with the 10 that you've invested in and even the 90 that you don't invest in. I tell the people I pass on investing in, hey, put me on your monthly update. And who knows, maybe in the future I'll invest. So take your time. If you're going to do this, and you had a quarter million dollar bankroll, don't put it all into one company. I want to go back, go slow. To, I want to, go back to your backstory yeah. so that people can understand a little bit better where you're coming from. Um, you didn't go to an Ivy League school. No, Fordham. Here Tell me why you went there. Well, I, uh, I had known some friends who had gone there, mm -hmm. and uh, I was going to go to Brooklyn College, which would have been two or three grand a year, and then I was gonna, wanted to go to Fordham, which was ten. And uh, I decided that if I went to Brooklyn College, I could go during the day and do it in four years. If I went to Fordham, I would be a better degree, a better experience, get to uh, go to school with the Jesuits, and uh, it would take five years at night. So I went to school at night, and then I hustled here in Manhattan fixing laser printers and being a, what's called a barback, which is the, not the bartender, but the guy who, or gal who carries the ice and the beer up for the bartender and taps the kegs. So I just worked odd jobs, but I was here in New York in the early 90s, late 80s and early 90s, when networking and the Internet and CD-ROMs happened. Mm -hmm. So I got very lucky. And, you know, you think about... Do you have a side hustle? You seem like a guy who would have a side hustle. I had a couple side hustles. My yeah. first side hustle was pretty interesting. I, my dad in his bar would play poker off hours. You know, the bar would close at four, so they have a poker game or backgammon. And one guy was into him for three or four dimes, so it's three or four grand. Guy couldn't pay. Guy said, hey, listen, give me a little bit of time. Put me on a payment plan. But here's the first payment. I got the Empire Strikes Back on tape. My dad said, how'd you get that? Because VHS tapes had just come out. And he said, uh, well, my guy, he taped it at the Fort Wayne Theater. He set up a thing. And he taped it. <laughs> like, and he had five machines there taping them. And I got one of the five copies. So I gave my dad that copy. So that I made copies of Empire Strikes Back. And I brought them to McKinley Junior High School in Brooklyn, public school. And I sold them for 20 bucks each. <laughs> that was my original side hustle. And I called it Jason's Hot Tapes. So I wasn't that smart. I, I was. Because you called them hot tapes. I right? called them hot tapes. Right. Yeah. yeah. So that lasted about a year, and I probably made a grand doing it. I sold a lot of cop. I'm sorry to George Lucas, <laughs> but I think he'll understand. He's doing okay. It's still I think my you favorite. Got to apologize film. to Bob Iger now. Yeah. As well, I, but, to to okay. the entire Lucasfilm family, right. I, I apologize. I owe you dinner, or sushi. And so, in the time when you're in college working at night, do you also have side hustles, or is that keeping you busy? Yeah, with the you know, printers I, and the and the bar back. The thing that was interesting at that time. Computers weren't networked, 
you know, and they didn't have Ethernet cables in them, so networking happened. Novell was a you know great public company for a long time, and Microsoft and Cisco started building networking hardware and software. And so uh, I was really into human rights and passionate about that, still am. Why? And, um, at the time. At the time, you know, it was very interesting. I was a big fan of Bob Dylan, and he had a song, Chimes of Freedom. And then I remember Bruce Springsteen, who was a fan of, had sung it for Amnesty International, and they did this human rights tour. And I was like, what's human rights? And I was like, well, everybody gets treated equally and torture and, you know, imprisoning people. I'm like, wow, people are in prison and being tortured in the world? I just, it was mind-blowing to me at the age of 18 or 19 that that was actually occurring. Mm -hmm. And so I saw that Amnesty International was looking for a computer specialist, and I went to work there. And so I worked for Amnesty International here in New York, setting up their computer systems. And my first job, since I knew databases and setting up computers, was to build the database of human rights abuses of women. And it was the first time anybody had ever put together this database. And it was a very inspiring and also depressing process because... Once I set up four computers, they had interns typing in all these cases, and they said, can you set up another four? Because we can't keep up with it. There's so many human rights abuses. Mm. And when the New York Times or ABC News would call and say, hey, we need to know what's going on, you know, in South America or China or, you know, pick the country, they would be doing searches on the database I built. And that was a very rewarding project. and really sort of showed me how technology could impact the world. Yeah. Because before that, if they had said, hey, can you tell us what's going on in Ecuador or you know, Brazil or something, they would say, uh, give us two or three weeks. We'll, we'll put a report together. It was all manual. It was right. all casework. We put all the cases into the database. And that was the start of me really realizing, gosh, this is going to change the world networking. And this was only a network of eight computers. It wasn't on the Internet. And then you started Silicon Alley Insider? Silicon Alley Reporter. Reporter, sorry. Right. I remember Silicon Henry Blodgett Insider did Silicon Alley Insider. Henry Blodgett, yes. Funny story. Well, we also have on the program Squawk Alley and CBC. Yeah, and so Henry said, I'm starting this thing Silicon Alley Insider. Can I give you 5% as like a tributary because I'm using your name, sort of? Uh -huh. And I said, you know, Henry, I cast a big shadow. Like, just do it yourself. I'll be an advisor for free. I'll write for the site. And I wrote for the site for a little while. But don't, don't give me the equity. And that was really stupid. That was the that, last time you... Uh, that 3 or 4%, I think it's worth $9 million when you sold it. So <laughs> I'm an idiot. I could have bought a house in Nantucket. I mean, that was really stupid. <laughs> so from now on, if somebody offers me money, uh, equity, I take it. <laughs> Why did you start it? Well, Silicon Alley Reporter was interesting. I was running around New York, and it was clear that CD-ROMs and the Internet would be something. And I used to be on the subway reading Paper Magazine, Spy Magazine at the time, Vanity Fair, uh, New Yorker, Esquire. And I just thought to myself, God, whoever writes these magazines and picks who's on the cover is really important because the person on the cover is super important. Mm -hmm. But the person who picks who's on the cover, that person's, that's the that power broker. That person is important to the person on the cover. Exactly. So I just <laughs> had this like meta like realization. It, I remember it like it was yesterday, just sitting there looking at the masthead saying, I want to be at the top of the masthead. And so how do you get to the top of the masthead? Well, you, you wait in line for 20 or 30 years. So I was like, F it. I'm going to go start my own. And I just started a 16-page photocopy, and I printed it up here on just on the block from us on 43rd and 6th at the Village Printers. And it was uh, tabloid paper that you fold in half and you put a stitch in the middle. And the, the photocopy machines could do that at the time. And, and paper, it, kids, is something that we get by killing trees exactly. and grinding them <laughs> into pulp. Yes. And then it, before we had screens, yeah. we used to actually print things using ink on paper. It used to be like how we got information. So I started this, and I said it would be $100 a year for 10 issues. And I started giving them out for free. And then I came to work that Monday, and there were 50 postcards or envelopes with checks in them. And I sat there opening the envelopes. You know, and... And it was 50 in like one week. And the next week it was 75. And I was like, $100 times 100 subscriptions is $10,000. And you know what it was like at that time? People didn't know what the internet was. So there was a magazine or a newsletter about the internet for 100 bucks. Screw it. I'll take five. And all of a sudden, five orders, 10 orders from one company with the names of 10 people. And I was just going to the, all of a sudden, there was $50,000 in a bank account. Mm. And really, when you start thinking about hustles, like this was the greatest hustle ever. I was like, I'm going to, produce 10 copies of this, give me $100, and then I'll send you 10. So they all sent me the money in advance. I didn't need investors. The only investors I really needed was Visa and American Express. Right. Uh, it's and a Kickstarter before Kickstarter. It was the, literally a Kickstarter subscription the magazine. in advance yeah. or Kickstarter before Kickstarter, yeah. Why, why did Henry Blodgett end up with that exit and you didn't? Well, 
I had a $20 million offer to sell to Internet.com, Alan Meckler's company. I'm sure he's watching this and he's going to be like, hmm, he should have taken it. Um, and I just thought I could build a $100 million company or a $200 million company. So when the Internet came apart and then 9-11, I sold the company to Dow Jones. I got two years of salary and a hundred grand, And then they fired me like a month after they started it. They're like, we really don't need you here. And I was like, but I have a two-year contract. And they're like, yeah, we're going to pay it off. I was like, what? <laughs> yes. like, we're going to send you a check for the entire amount next week. And I was like, oh, wow. And now I'm like, ah, this is the best thing ever. It's like Phil Jackson getting fired for the Knicks again in the last $25 million. Not quite that good, but Not yes. Not that good. It was, but it was two years of pay, so let me think. And I started the blog company in that time. And the blog company, when AOL offered to buy it for $30 million, I was like, yes. Because I was like, <laughs> the last time I screwed this up, the next time somebody offers me tens of millions of dollars for something I own, I'm selling it. And I sold it. And then people told me I sold too early. And I was like, please, let this be the one time I sold too early. <laughs> like, at some point, you have to book a win. And uh -huh. that was my early win. So literally two weeks ago, one of my most promising companies in my portfolio, young companies, um, which I owned like, I don't know, four, three or 4% of, and I'd given them 100 grand or something. They called me and they said, oh, I've got great news. I said, what is it? They said, well, you know we we're going to raise the Series A. I was like, yeah, I know you're going to go raise the Series A because all the VCs are calling me asking me to put a good word in for you, and you went dark on me for two weeks. He goes, we're selling the company. I said, what? He said, yeah, we're getting 30 or $40 million for the company. And I was like, oh, my God. Wait, wait why? Did we sign the paper yet? He's like, yeah, no, we're all done. I'm like, oh, my God. You, why did you do that? And they're like, well, we thought you'd be happy because we just, we're going to give you back like seven hundred thousand, six or $700,000. You gave us $100,000 18 months ago. I was like, this is the worst day of the year for me. I, like, we could have gone... 100x from here. I, I didn't want 7x. I wanted 70 or 700. <laughs> and he's like, oh, I I'm sorry. And I, I was like, so I tried to unravel the deal. I was like, can, we, can I get somebody to buy your secondary shares or whatever? But, you know, they were getting bought by a great company and there's three founders or whatever, and they each get 10 or 15 million bucks, whatever it is. So when this kind of stuff happens, I just have to be happy for the founder and remember sure. that I had that moment too. And you can cry over the fact that you only made 6 or 7x your money. Exactly. But it is painful sometimes when you watch it and you, you just know. I, I need founders to be greedier. And that's really like the investors need the founders to not take the quick money, not take the 10x. If you look at Instagram or you look at YouTube, those companies got sold for a billion and 1.6 billion. Mm. YouTube 1.6 uh, and Instagram for a billion. If those companies were independent today, YouTube would be worth 75 to 125 billion. And I would say Instagram would be worth, you know, it's, it's probably four Snapchat, so it'd probably be worth 50. And so 50x on a billion dollars or 50x on 1.6 billion. You start thinking about those numbers, that's 50x on a very large number. That's not 50x on 100,000. Right. That's 50x on a billion dollars. <laughs> There's very few opportunities. If, I, if somebody came in here and put a billion dollars here and said, come back with 50x, we'd be like, what do we do? Right. What do you, how do you make 50X with a billion? It's very hard. Very hard. Uh, so, yeah, it's a, it a bummer. Well, Jason, thank you. The book, again, is Angel. Thank you, my friend. And say the rest of the title for me. Uh, Angel, I got lucky. How to invest in I got lucky and startups. invested in Uber <laughs> and five other billion dollar yes. companies. Timeless advice from an angel investor who turned $100,000 into $100 million. It's been great. Thanks, John. I appreciate you. it. Also on the podcast this week, folks, Fort Knox. You can check it out on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, wherever fine podcasts are distributed. We have Microsoft President Brad Smith. We are talking about, goodness, the, the global threats that are out there in technology. We're also talking about antitrust. Interesting conversation. He's got some advice for Amazon, Facebook, Google, some mm -hmm. of the big names now who are in the position Microsoft was in 20 years ago when he was running Microsoft's unsuccessful defense against those antitrust charges. Uh, be sure to check that out. You can find it at fortknox.com, also F-O-R-T-T-K-N-O-X.com. Thank you guys for lending an ear and for viewing this live stream. And thanks again to Jason Calacan. Thanks for having me. Great. Appreciate it. See you next time.